Good afternoon. This is Mike Farley, Poolside Perspective Podcast, and we're happy to be here to get into another uh, adventure into water. And this one's a little bit different than normal, so it's just going to be a, a fun time. I'm sure this will be uh, listened to by a lot of people, young and old, in the future. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there's a, a diverse amount of people that are going to be interested in our guest. That's yeah. for sure. My granddaughter, Elena, is really interested in the whole situation. And I'm sure she wasn't uh, interested in the previous episodes. Not no. as much as this one, at no. least. Yeah, no. <laughs> but her, her mom's probably pretty interested in it, too. So yeah, awesome. We're going to have some uh, magic today in today's episode. So how, how's your week been? Uh, week's been good. Uh, today was a little crazy. Yeah, um, you've been a bachelor all week. Yeah, the last about 10 days, my uh, girlfriend has been in New York, so she's finally back, and I'm happy to see that, but unfortunately, she works night shifts, so we'll, we'll eventually get together and have a nice little date, um, but yeah, it's good to see her again, um, that's for sure. Yeah, you, you got to pick her up at the airport, Yep. and I brought the dog, and we swapped you for the dog. Yeah, <laughs> one dog for another dog, <laughs> there you go. Elle is a world-renowned professional mermaid entertainer, conservationist, and filmmaker with social media followings of over 4 million fans across all platforms. She performs at upscale and celebrity events as a poolside specialty act. Born and raised in the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico, Elle was fascinated by all things ocean and nature, as well as performing arts. She created the character... Mermaid L in 2016 in hopes to promote ocean conservation through educational entertainment. L has also founded the Saving the Seas nonprofit organization to spread ocean conservation message globally. Now, with Mermaid L's Saving the Seas YouTube series and chapter books, L continues to inspire youth to protect the oceans all around the world. Well, that's going to be amazing. I look forward to talking to L. Our podcast is all about water. Yep. Okay. And so we love water and we think water is the coolest thing in the world for people to water be around. Water is the coolest thing. And, yes. And the challenge is there's only so much ocean in this country. And so our job is to fill in for all those people that aren't on the ocean, that they get to experience water in their, their backyards and their environments. And, you know, so I, I designed crazy swimming pools. And it, it's been a Love lot it. of fun for 35 years to do that. So the, one of the things that we talked about not too long ago, we had Rowdy Gaines on and, uh, he's, he's over there in Paris doing the Olympics right now. But, uh, he, he talked to us a lot about swimming and things like that, but it was mostly focused on youth. And so you have a really unique perspective is you, you didn't know how to swim as an adult. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And so how That's did you, correct. how did you go about, I think that'd be really interesting for the people that listen to our podcast. Uh, how did you go about learning how to swim? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a fear that, um, a fear of the unknown. I had to take like swimming lessons and I became scuba certified because I felt like I needed to immerse myself into the world of a mermaid before I could take on the job. And before I could even consider it. And I think I started taking swimming lessons when I was 26. And I am not ashamed of that at all. I think that any time in life is it would be good to to learn how to swim, to experience water, to not hold back. Because I, I was that type of person that was like past my knees or above my knees and never, you know, <laughs> or I didn't want to get my hair wet and things like that. And it's really such a wonderful world that I discovered thanks to swimming, thanks to overcoming that, not really overcoming that fear at the time, but just having the, just the will and the courage to, to learn and to put myself into that situation that I was, that it was the unknown for me. It took a lot of courage. And I, I really think that there are opportunities out there to learn. I took swimming lessons. Um, once I was done with that, I became lifeguard certified because I was like, if I can help rescue someone who is having trouble swimming, then I will be really good at swimming. Right. And that was my logic at the time. And I failed every single lifeguard um, skill test the first time I had to redo it. 
And I really think that the lifeguard certification was what really taught me how to swim. And then I became a scuba diver. And in scuba diving, that was a whole different fear. That was like claustrophobia. And then you have all this equipment on and then you're super deep in the ocean. I love a good challenge, though. So I think that that's part of who I am. Um, I, I don't like saying no to things because I've never tried them. And I think it's important to, as we get older, to kind of like open up, open up our minds and and try new things. And that was the new thing for me at the time. And I don't regret it, honestly. Just scuba diving overall and learning how to swim opened up my, it changed my life to, for the better. Yeah. I be, love it. It'd be hard to be, <laughs> although there are a lot of mermaids. I've been to a couple of events and the mermaids sit on the edge of the pool and they don't do anything. Yeah. You're a little different first, than that, right? Yeah. When I first started, that's what I had in my mind when my client at the time asked me to perform at an event. I was like, well, I don't want to just sit next to the pool. I do like more like dancing. Like I'm a, I'm a mover. I love to move and I like to entertain people. And um, he was like, no, 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 it would be, it would be swimming. And I'm like, well, that's different. Cause at the time there wasn't a lot of mermaid performers that were actually in the pool. They were just like models. And I was like, this could be something different and new for the entertainment industry overall. And that's exactly what it was. It was once I started, it became even more and more popular. I kept sharing that on social media. And I feel like I have had a little bit of the, like the reason why it became so popular. I started getting bookings like every weekend. So it just, people started seeing this is an actual thing and you can actually swim with this costume, depending on the costume, of course. I was very reluctant in the beginning. And I was like, you know what? There's an opportunity for something new in the entertainment world. And I am down to explore it a little bit. So I'm glad I did. Tell us something interesting that wasn't on the bio. That wasn't on the bio? Yes. Um, I'm an oversharer. Like I always tell my story like with all of the, the details. Um, I was a busy dancer back in the day. I don't know if that's on my bio, but I have worked with celebrities as a dancer before I was a mermaid. Um, I definitely did my own thing back in the day. I opened for an En Vogue concert. I was in a Kanye West music video. Oh, wow. Very, very weird, weird things. Um, <laughs> but I was in a break dancing company as well. I used to be a, a B-girl, like a break dancer. So uh, that's something that might not be in my bio. We're just interested in how your journey started. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how you became to be the professional that you are? Um, well, I definitely had a passion for performing arts. Um, I was always that kid that wanted to be loud and look at me, mommy, and doing all the the dances and things like that. I started with ballet and um, I just love being on stage since I was a little girl. And I decided to pursue my a dance career. Honestly, it was never about nothing to do with mermaids. And I went for it and I opened my own entertainment company in Miami um, where I could like perform with other dancers and also provide that as a service. It was my first business ever. So I had never um, had my own business and uh, it became really successful in Miami until one day I got asked to be a mermaid for an event and I didn't know how to swim. So that was problematic at the time. <laughs> but uh, I, I said no at first, actually, to my first um, mermaid inquiry. You went from uh, being asked to be a mermaid for the first time and you said no. And then you started learning how to swim and then uh, the scuba diving and the, the, the lifeguarding. So what pushed you to, what inspired you to actually Say, you know what? I'm going to try out this mermaid thing. My friends, oh, okay. uh, really. My friends were like, oh, why would you not try something if you have an opportunity here? Yeah. Why won't you try it? And I'm like, because I'm, I don't know how to swim. 
<laughs> and they're like, well, why don't you learn? And sometimes that's what friends are for. Yeah. You know, they just, you know, the ones who really love you, they they feel like you're more capable than you think you are. Right. Give you that <laughs> and, push. And um, it really was just my friends who who pushed me to try something new and something exciting. That's awesome. What does a professional mermaid do? I mean, you, do you uh, do you go to events or do you swim? At, like I saw something that you go to Atlantis. Uh, you've swam there. That's the coolest place I've ever been on vacation. And, oh, you have been. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And sitting in that dining area and looking out at all the huge aquarium there where you can see everything swimming and stuff like that. So explain what do you do? Right now, it's 2024, and I feel like the mermaid world has evolved into several different things. Right. But I'm still kind of doing the same thing I, I did in the very beginning, which is entertainment. So I'm a mermaid entertainer. Okay. And I basically act like the mermaid character, and I perform in the water, underwater. My performance has gotten to a point where like I can get good clients like that like Atlantis is uh really hard to get in there and um and all, obviously like swim in the aquarium in any aquarium is not something that you can just approach someone and be like can I swim in there with <laughs> sharks and stingrays yeah not something you would do but to be approached that way and to develop like this nice clientele through my work has been just so wonderful and I really think it's just treating it like any other business um I'm a professional mermaid entertainer but I also manage my business my bookings my my clients I have a team now which is great um and uh doing my own marketing and website design and everything like that um it's just treating it like any other business during the weekdays I'm usually doing that I'm doing emails and in some content, interviews, things like that for press. During the weekends, that's when I do mostly events. I also do a lot of brand partnerships like on social media now. So being a professional mermaid is mostly entertainment for me, but it also is um, brand partnerships on social media as an influencer. And uh, I used to teach. I'm not teaching much these days, but I used to be a a uh, diving instructor. So I would take people out into the ocean and teach them how to dive, free dive as okay. a mermaid in a mermaid tail. And that was super exciting. I did that uh, in different locations in California, in the Caribbean. Um, and it was such a, a blast. It's just very like time consuming and I'm focusing more on my entertainment. I'm writing a book and just kind of growing my brand as mermaid ale, like this, this character. Um, that can come to events and bring her mermaid magic to others. So that's cool. I I'm curious. Um, with like the <laughs> the aquarium, when you're swimming with the fishes, I'm sure you have to get like some kind of like handling or like license or something to do that. Is was that like a hard process to go through to actually learn how to like swim with the sharks and stingrays and all these different quote unquote dangerous <laughs> animals? <clears throat> So I'm a free diver. Okay. Um, I'm free dive certified and I'm scuba diver certified. Okay. And those are the main requirements you should have. And I'm also a CPR instructor, like not just CPR certified, I'm a CPR instructor. Yeah. So you, you do have to have these um, training and certification um, qualifications to work in a place like that. Yeah. But the traffic underwater with the fish and the mm -hmm. sharks and the stingrays, that is something you just learn uh, as you go. Oh, wow. And on the I've, job? <laughs> on the crazy. job. It's yeah. just, you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I have this, this really amazing memory at Atlantis on my first year there, because I did three years. Um, my first year, they had a giant, well, it was a baby manta ray, but she was pretty giant for a baby. Her name was Hope and she was beautiful, just gliding through the water all the time. And uh, we had a safety diver that would tell us, you know, like, because it was me and two other girls that would tell us the, the manta ray is coming, Hope is coming. Um, so we would just like let her be and not swim by the windows when she was coming by. And one time 
nobody told me anything. So I just went and I looked up and I saw this long tail. Um, and I saw that hope was right in front of me. <laughs> and, you know, I, I freaked out a little bit, not going to lie, but I didn't let it show because there's like, I don't know, 50 something people by the windows watching. So uh, I just kept like swimming behind her and we did this beautiful like dance together for like a, a second. And it was such a beautiful moment together with this giant manory um, at Atlantis. But yeah, it happens. Um, I bumped into fish and things like that, but uh, they bump into me sometimes on purpose. And uh, it's just a lot of fun, honestly. I'm not, I feel like I'm not scared of animals. I never was scared of animals. It was just mostly being in water and not being able to breathe and all of that. Yeah. Um, so being with the with the marine, um, marine life there is just, and in the ocean too, it's so much fun. So you're always holding your breath in like an aquarium setting you're never wow that's that's it okay so we did have a question D danny had a question for you about how long can you hold your breath um the longest i have been able to that i could have held it longer i just kind of was i quit i was like i i'm gonna surface now was three minutes and 15 seconds so it's it's okay to me it's like it's never been about pushing it or pushing the, the limits and the boundaries. It's more about how long do I need to stay down here to entertain my audience, but also not make them feel bored. Because if I'm there the entire time for a long time, then they're just like, okay, what is she going to do now? You know? Right. So I kind of, I like the mystery. So usually for a tank performance, because I have my own tank as well, um, I can stay under underwater for like a minute things like that then i go away for a little while then i come back and just kind of keep that mystery going that's awesome so how did you teach yourself to hold your breath that long so the the free diver certification teaches you how to do it properly gotcha but what really taught me was just continuously doing it um you can only improve your breath hold gradually because your body sure. has to get used to that carbon dioxide buildup. When you're holding your breath, you're just building up this carbon dioxide that's kind of toxic. It could shut down your organs, shut down your 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 all functions in your body, and you can black out. Um, so it's it's a very important thing to not force it and to just kind of like let that breath hold improve gradually and. Now that it's been eight years, I feel like I am more comfortable underwater than I am out here. So it's just, it's second, amazing. Second nature. Um, yeah, that's great. I'm wondering, because uh, you were a dancer before you got into this industry, how was it from going from like break dancing and that choreography to trying to perform underwater? Was there like, you were doing backflips and stuff now, or was there like a, a different change where it was like, or was it pretty much the same, you were just dancing underwater? How was that? Yeah, yeah it's that's a great question um i love dancing and it's always gonna be like my first love yeah and um with mermaiding and performance as a mermaid i feel like i do translate my dance my my dance passion um with choreography and steps and kind of like just the logistics of what i'm gonna do and the movements, backflips and tricks and things like that. It's um super, super fun. The one thing that I don't get is like cardio. And, you know, I am not like super active moving a lot. I'm moving very slow and gentle so I can hold my breath because if I move too fast, then I my body will feel like it needs more oxygen. Okay. You know, I will use up more oxygen. Yeah, so I'm sense. usually just slow and and it's more about strength because um, if I'm slow, I'm also swimming with 40 pounds on me. So it's a different type of physical um, physical activity than, than dancing. But I, I do fulfill my dance love through mermaiding uh, just by performing for others and, and doing all my tricks and fun things that they've never seen before. So it's really cool. 
We're going to take a break here for a second and get into outdoor living. So with outdoor living, we like to go to barbecue bits here. We're going to share some information and everything that you may want to consider in your outdoor living space as far as features, especially for the kitchen. Hope you enjoy this. So I cook on my egg and so I come in and get my lump charcoal but I, I don't think a lot of people at least when I first started cooking I didn't know the difference between oh going and getting something that I put you know that wasn't a lump charcoal and, and a lump charcoal right. and then there's pellets and so walk me through all these fuels and flavor and things you can do in a environment. So hardwood lump charcoal um, it's complicated and I say this by <laughs> of my end users and my consumers when they buy products from us they don't want subpar charcoal um, uh, brands that you get at mass merch stores uh, uh, amen to that <laughs> amen to that because I've tried all kinds of stuff under an emergency it is and you'll put and your it, eye out on it, some of this stuff it, but <laughs> it's you get a whole mixed bag so we carry brands like Rockwood, Fogo, Jealous Devil, Wine, um, Optimum Flavor so uh, when you go to a party, you don't use generic brand chips. You're probably going to bring Frito-Lay. Well, these are name brands, not chips, but charcoal. So it's just not lump charcoal. So most mass merch charcoal is wood flooring. It can be two by fours. This is actually natural wood. This is like a pecan, oak, and hickory mix. They, um, they take all of this wood and they'll burn it and deprive it of air. And in, the, in that process in a kiln and it becomes charcoal. These flavors are very, not real robust, but very flavorful. Uh, your cooking experience, you, you, you get more cooks out of this charcoal. You don't just go, you know, and have to replenish every time. So when you come in and you say, hey, listen, I'm looking to do a pork shoulder, I'm looking to cook, we're gonna, remit, we're gonna recommend the charcoal, number one, but also the fuel. You know, fruit wood, so if we, we have all like cherry, this is where you're gonna get your flavor. Uh, you've got cherry, you've got apple. Um, if I'm doing a brisket, I'm probably gonna do that Texas staple uh, post oak is what I'll do. Hey, Bobby, I wanna mix it and turn it up a little bit. I wanna maybe mix a little hickory uh, and oak together. That's, that's on you, you know, go for it. But uh, all, if I'm doing fish, we'll probably want some of the fruit wood. So this is your fuel and this is your flavor. So I noticed your mesquite is empty. Uh, but mesquite's a little bit tricky when you use that it uh, is. from it a is. flavor standpoint. I learned that. So. It is. Mesquite is a weed in Texas, <laughs> but if you cook flank steak or even ribeye, it gets a great flavor. If you go to um, one of our local um, uh, Tex-Mex restaurants, they're probably cooking over mesquite. Number one, because that particular wood enhances with the charcoal. It gets really hot, but it gives it that distinct uh, cultural flavor. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference between this and a pellet? Um, a pellet's going to have a binder. It's going to be compressed wood. Okay. And this is going to be all natural uh, versus like a briquette. A briquette's going to be compressed. It's going to have lump charcoal. It's going to have compressed uh, petroleum distillates. It's going to have uh, clays where this is all natural. So you don't really burp too much at the end or get indigestion off of natural lump charcoal. Versus the briquettes. Versus the briquettes, that's yeah. right. Awesome, well, yeah. appreciate that information. Yeah, you bet. So I hope you enjoyed the barbecue bits that we just featured today, and we'll have more coming up next week. If there's something in particular that you're interested for, let us know, and we'll get back into the episode now. So we did have a question from a kid named Olivia. And she was asking how your tail felt. So that might go into also like it's 40 pounds. That's, I didn't even think about that. That's why. Yeah. So how does oh, my your tail? Yeah. <laughs> well, for Olivia, um, my tail feels very, very real. It's slimy when it's wet and it's got scales and it's got this awesome texture. It's very, very fish like. Um, it's also very heavy. So it does weigh around 40 pounds. It's hard to travel with. It's hard to put it on and transform. Um, but, uh, but it's all worth it. And you kind of have to train your body to, to be strong. Yeah. So, you, you, <laughs> so we had several questions from kids. So one, one 
question was from Elena, which is my granddaughter. She wanted to know what your uh, mermaid house looks like. <laughs> my mermaid house? <laughs> yes. Of course. Well, under the sea, I live in a kingdom called Atlantropia. And it's in a trench in the Caribbean where the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean meet. And my kingdom is beautiful. It's full of corals. And my home is actually a giant shell that opens up in the morning. And uh, at night it closes. And that's where I sleep, where I eat. But usually I'm out in the open water saving the seas. That's my main job. So I just come home and I and I get into my shell to cuddle up with my friends. <laughs> and And then I go to sleep. So that is my my house under the sea. That's usually what I tell the kids. Yeah. So one more question from the kids is uh, Olivia, who who asked the question about your tail. She wanted to know if you wished you had legs. (laughs) Ah, you know, I wish I had legs so I could dance a little more. You know how I love to dance (laughs) sometimes, but, um, but I love using my fins because I get to explore the entire ocean with them. So I think I like both. And I've always thought, like, why did Ariel want to become a human full time? That's crazy. I would love to just do both. And I do. And it's super fun. And one more. Uh, How did you get your crown? (gasps) Well, I earned my crown. I had to earn it. I had to do a really good job at Saving the Seas, which is my number one mission and i defeated the big giant pollution monster gunk and uh with my friends with my sea friends with my mermaid sisters and i earned the crown that's what happens when you do a good job of protecting the oceans so you're (laughs) you said you're a superhero in the seas and so saving the seas is explain to us what that is because that's a really cool program Yeah, Saving the Seas started out as an initiative um, for my work. I needed kind of a a purpose to to do the mermaid work, the mermaid thing. (laughs) And this was a great purpose. Becoming a scuba diver really opened my eyes to what's down there and uh, what shouldn't be down there. You know, garbage and, and just toxic chemicals and things like that. And um, it started out just as a message, as a as a way, a message for me to uh, showcase during my performances for children. And now it's a nonprofit organization, and we do the same things. We uh, inspire children to protect the ocean through arts, through entertainment, and it's based on Mermaid Elle's job as a as a superhero princess so it's really really cool um to get to this point of like it's an actual nonprofit. anyone it's a public charity anyone can join in and do their part we do beach cleanups and we repurpose that trash into eco art and um it's just so wonderful to teach that to others we also are trying now to create uh, actual curriculums for ocean education to be a part of uh, schools or just ho- just part of ho- you know being at home with your parents. Um, so that's why I'm working on the book and a few lessons with some of our volunteers, um, just to bring in more ocean education into homes. I think that that's what could really create a sense of uh, responsibility in people and in children for the most part so that they can grow up to be responsible adults and help take care of our oceans and our planets. Very, very important. Uh, and yeah. there's very few people that, that teach that, especially to youth. So I think that's a awesome program. You have these, uh, YouTube videos that you oh, do yeah. and you, uh, go and teach, uh, different lessons about the ocean and, and the, the, the animals that are in the ocean. And so how did that all come about doing all this graphic <laughs> art and that, that type of stuff? Do you have h- hire someone to do that or how did it all start? Oh, I, I do it all. Well, my partner helps me film, but before I was a mermaid, 
I actually worked in film for 13 years. I was a video editor for the most part, but I also did pre-production like screenwriting and casting and things like that. This was like, while I was dancing on the side, you know, I was, I had a job. I had a real people job (laughs) before I was a mermaid. And it was in film. I went to film school and I graduated in 2010. And I just love being, I love being in front and behind the cameras. I love the whole process of creation and the creative process of writing something and just making it happen as a visual. And with my character, I was like, I can't, I didn't want to just do private events and shows and small, you know, performances. I wanted to, I wanted my message to reach a wider audience. So I was like, maybe I could try to come up with a a script and make a series online on YouTube. And, and I don't know how I did it. I still don't know how I do it. Um, I have to like interview people and I have to go down into the ocean and, and film certain animals. And, and then I have my own green screen and uh, edit everything together. Uh, Eventually I would love to have a team Uh, right now. It's just kind of like, it's something that I do uh, for the nonprofit. It's kind of like my part of my contribution. So there's no budget. <laughs> I'm a, that is like a passion project for me. That's awesome. I'm wondering, uh, <laughs> do you have like a favorite story or favorite performance or event you've ever done as a mermaid that you can recall maybe? Oh yeah, I have so many. I, bet, I have so yeah. many favorite stories. Be, being a mermaid, this whole career has been so magical, and not just for me. If if I were to talk about myself and what it has done for me, I mean, I got to perform right in front of Bruno Mars. That oh, wow. is amazing. That's really cool. <laughs> and and go to like these incredible places and travel. Um, but if I'm talking about my my work and my purpose as an entertainer it's mostly about the people that that watch the show and the people and the interactions that I've, that I've had um i love working with kids uh they're like they're like everything to me i feel like kids are the future they're the most important um thing on this planet right now and i love working with them so i would say that my favorite right now I got to say this summer, I had my first tank show. I I bought a tank and (laughs) I had to like fill it up. It's a thousand gallon tank. And, uh, and I did this saving the seas show that was educational. And I was saying, you know, lip syncing and mouthing the words underwater with like windows and the kids were all watching, sitting down. And that has to be like such an amazing experience. Uh, the kids would come up to the windows and put their hands on on the glass and like putting the hands to them and throwing hearts at them. And that's just pure magic. So lately, that's been my favorite type of performance is just to be in my tank and and see little kiddos through the glass. That's awesome. So we we are predominantly a pool design podcast where we talk about pool design um, and we do use acrylic windows in a lot of our projects. So I'm wondering, because I'm sure you've been in a bunch of different pools with acrylic windows, like residential and hotels. Um, what do you think is like the, can you think of like the coolest place you've been that's not an aquarium? Uh, I've been in a lot of pools. I've been in like, I was thinking about it the other day. I think it's been like maybe 200 or 300 pools okay, that's in, a lot. My, in my lifetime as yeah. a mermaid. Um, I love the acrylic windows, obviously. Um, those are very rare. I feel like I see a lot of these like waterfalls and yep. just fun structures and there's structures in the pool, like you sit in the pool or um, fire pits and things like that. Really cool. Um, my favorite pool, I've been in a lot of resorts and I think resort pools are like, are so fun, but it's also like, can I say it? Can I say it on here? Sure. Like resort, resort pools, uh, they're like gross, you know? (laughs) They're just like, everybody's in there. Um, I've been in a couple like really nice homes, like mansion type homes. And uh, the pools have been wonderful. Like a bridge in the middle and like 
rivers, waterfalls, fountains, and yep. things like that. Saltwater pools definitely are my favorite. Um, and uh, I've been to a lot of like rooftop pools that are not as intricate at all, but it's kind of cool to be like you have that up view, there yeah. and have the view of the city. And and then I'm a mermaid in the pool. That's just just so funny. <laughs> so one of the questions we had from a, a fellow pool designer, uh, he was wondering if you ever swam in a lazy river as a mermaid. Not as a mermaid, no. Um, I've been in a lazy river, yeah. uh, like in my off hours, like when I work at a resort. I'm like, but not as a mermaid. I've been in um in a slide, like a water park slide. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. As a mermaid, it's so fun. So, <laughs> so did you go through the shark tank in Atlantis? In your yeah, yeah, but not not in my tail. <laughs> not as a mermaid, but I did. I did. It was awesome. It was yeah. so cool. It's Even though, like, if I'm in the ocean, oh, wow. if I'm in the ocean, I might see the sharks right there. But the actual design of the the tank underwater with the sharks, so cool. Loved it. Yeah, that that was a fun ride. Uh, I said that. that have was you a... have you ever had a mermaid in your pools? I, I not yet. So uh, see, we gotta make that happen. Yes, I, I think that would be <laughs> interesting. We're going to take a break for design concepts now. So design concepts, what we're going to do is talk about why we did the things on a particular job. All right, so we're doing design concepts. So I'm here with Mr. Mike Farley. Um, have you ever designed a pool? Does something come to mind? So I'm just wondering, have you done a design with an acrylic window? Oh, yeah. So uh, one of the projects the first let's talk about the first one i did so the okay. first one i did was about 13 years ago and it was well received it was had was featured on hgtv uh, i can't remember the name of the episode but if you go into my uh youtube channel we've got highlights of it there but the clients wanted to see something cool from inside the house and so the first thing that we had to do conceptually is we were looking at primary views and they had a corner fireplace on their back porch and the corner fireplace wiped out most of the views of the backyard because you know the the first person that owned the house wanted to see a fire and this client was well actually no they built the house and but that that was the concept initially is well we'll, we'll want to hang out by the fireplace but when we started talking about what they wanted to do in the backyard i was like can we tear the fireplace out? And they were like, 100%, if we can put a fireplace in somewhere else. So we actually tore the fireplace out of the, the porch, and which opened up views to the backyard, You know, basically a 90-degree a, a uh, corridor that we could see some things. And so they wanted to see something really cool uh, as they looked out of the family room and in the kitchen area. And so what was decided is that was going to be the deep end of the pool. And what we thought about was, wouldn't it be cool to actually see into the pool as the kids went off the diving board and, you know, they did flips and, you know, catching the football and all these things. So we actually came in and across the deep end, we put an acrylic window. Now, what was unique about this particular project is they loved elevation changes and their lot was almost flat. And what happened is way in the back corner, it tapered off and dropped Whoa, it dropped to the street. <laughs> <laughs> Way in the back corner, it dropped off to the street. And so what we ended up actually doing is the pool ended up 12 inches higher than the back porch. And then we actually sunk off the back porch down 12 inches. And this made a 24-inch elevation change in that courtyard area to the top of the pool. And so that gave us our window which was 24 inches tall that we could look down into the, uh, the pool itself. And what the thing we did also is they wanted a vanishing edge. Well, the vanishing edge, actually the water spilled towards the house. And so this went into a really narrow channel. Uh, and then it went into a tank that we built underneath the ground. So you can see, actually there wasn't a basin. Uh, this job had lots of firsts, uh, that was done. So one of the, th things that we did also besides the acrylic window is we, it was the first job we used synthetic grass on for deck areas. 
Now we'd used synthetic grass in a, in a dog run before, uh, which we, it was really great because the dogs couldn't wear it out and the dogs didn't come in the house dirty, but they, they wanted it to incorporate and provide some contrast to the decking. And we, they liked it so much that their daughter ended up putting turf in her bedroom and they took the carpet out. Uh, so <laughs> she really loved that, uh, aspect wow. of it. So the other thing about this design is it was very modern style that they wanted to create, although the house wasn't, you know, quite as modern. So it was blending with the architecture of the home and blending with what the style was. The really cool thing about it is the client. His father was a tile uh, setter, and so she knew all about tile, I mean, more than probably any other client I've ever had in my career, and she started talking about materials that she wanted to use, and she said, I, I just want stuff that's different that people haven't used before. So she started talking about this one tile that she wanted to, to install, which looked like wood. And I was like, what, what do you mean? It looks like wood. And she says, it looks like a, a plank of wood, but it's tile. This is 14 years ago? This is 14 years ago. Okay. She okay. said, I found some in Germany. <laughs> and I'm like, you found a tile in Germany that you want to use? And she said, yeah, I haven't found any of this. So we came in and we used this tile and it was on the veneer of the pool and all the steps that are gone into the, the backyard going and transitioning up and down, this tile was used. Well, this tile today, you can find in every single, it's porcelain tile that looks like wood. Yeah. Okay. But you got to realize 14 years ago, it was non-existent in the United States. The backdrop right there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right here, right behind me on the wall. Okay. This, this material right here was not available anywhere in the United States. And so she had this tile, porcelain tile imported from Germany and we use that and, and, she just came up with a lot of creative ideas that she was like, let's try this. So one of the things that we also had to do is because we were maxed out square footage with the structures in the backyard, we we're, were building a cabana that we put the fireplace in. We also had a pool house that was already there that we were going to incorporate with the kitchen, but the, the, we wanted more shade over the kitchen area. And so we came up with the, using this louvered structure. So this was the first job that I used a Equinox structure on. Oh, wow. So it was louvered and it, when it shut, it was a hundred percent waterproof and it was a great material. And we used that under the, uh, the, the, over the kitchen area. So the, the other thing that was really cool is we did the spa separate, which was so they could heat the spa up and it didn't mix with the pool water every single night because they like to use the spa and so the thought process was, well, if we heat it up and it's 100 tonight, tomorrow it'll only be 90, 90 degrees. It'll just take a few minutes to heat up. But to do that, we had to have it on a totally separate equipment set. So there was so many cool things on this particular job. There's a water wall on the back of the job that they wanted to create a feature. And that was something we worked on for months trying to come up. And she found this, again, a textured tile now, today, there are all kinds of textured tiles, but yep. 14 years ago, that didn't exist. No. You couldn't find a texture. And for years, people were like, where'd you get this? And can I get it? And, and I, she didn't ever tell me where she got some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was because she wanted unique. She wanted something nobody else had. And it was a great ad adventure from a designer standpoint of uh, all these different things that you could do. And they have a, an awesome home. They're an awesome family. Uh, and it, what was so funny is if you look at the before pictures, they, when they were building the house, they just were like, uh, here, let's build something like this. And later on, it served none of their functions. It wasn't deep enough. They wanted a diving board. It wasn't big enough to play volleyball in uh, because of the shape was so unique that you couldn't even put it. They didn't have a tanning ledge. Uh, so all the things that they hated about that pool that we blew up, uh, we basically came in with, you know, an awesome situation on, on that particular pool. So it's a fun pool. Uh, the acrylic window was the cherry on top. Uh, but that was the first one that I ever did. So it would be a great place for, uh, you know, mermaid L to come swim. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, 
uh, I know lots of other people have, and you can see it on HGTV. Uh, when they were filming it, the boys were diving off the diving board with the football into the pool and seeing, you know, who had the best dive because you oh, could see awesome. from the top and the bottom. Yeah, you get a better view. And that's when you first said this job was a, a job, a lot of firsts. You really meant it because you went down the list. That's crazy. A lot of the stuff that what you think is standard nowadays, which I know wasn't the case back in the day, you used. 14, not even a decade ago, 14 years ago. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So anyway, that the design concept was to come up with a pool that served a lot of functions. It was a, uh, had a vanishing edge on it and a fairly flat lot. And then also bring a lot of organic look and a modern feel, uh, to a space, which it was, uh, you know, people look at it today and are like, that, that's stunning. And it is the style that we've done for the last five, six years over and over again. But yep. this was done way before that. What was funny is when we entered it in the design awards, I thought, this is a really cool pool. And, and all we got was a bronze. Wow. Uh, and I was like, okay, I got an international bronze. I'll enter it in regionals. I'll get something good there. It got a bronze at, at, at there. <laughs> but I got the last laugh. It was on HGTV. I mean, if you submitted it now... It would probably get a gold. <laughs> well, it was funny because they used to have a, a category for pools that were 10 years old. Oh, okay. I couldn't wait to enter it because I'm like, when this comes around for 10 years, people will be like, there's no way you built that 10 years yeah, ago. That's a lock. Yeah. They ended it the year before it qualified. Oh, man. <laughs> so that category went away. Anyway. Well, it was definitely a pool before its time. Uh, anyway. It, it, a lot of it had to do with the, the client. She was just... Uh, uh, a very visionary person and she had resources that, you know, that most people wouldn't think of because of her dad, yeah. you know, the, his experience in the tile industry, but uh great project. And uh, we'll have some pictures of it on our uh, website as well as we'll do some uh, video clips of it. Uh, and it, it was one of the ones that I believe we dropped that one yet on. If not, it may be coming up soon of the Blow It Up and Start Over series as well. But thanks again. Thank you for walking me through this. This is awesome. One thing, uh, along with this uh, swimming pool, some swimming pool questions that we have here. Um, actually, Cape Cali uh, sent this question in, and they said they love you. Uh, they said that love them. <laughs> they wanted to know if you had a preferred depth. Do you prefer swimming in shallower water or deeper water? Right. Um, I feel like most pools are like three to five feet and it's like, <laughs> I, I rarely fit. Um, yes, I prefer deep pools. Okay. I would say um, eight feet is awesome. And that's like, I've seen that at like a resort, eight feet. Um, that's pretty much as deep as I've seen. Um, I was in like an actual dive well. That's 15 feet, but that's not like an actual pool. Right. But yeah, the deeper, the better. Okay. I need, I need space to like do my tricks and, and move around in my tail. Like I'm little as a human in my human form, but as a mermaid, I'm like seven feet long, you know? So I'm curious, do you think it's easier with the tail on to swim vertically? Like to, to just stay afloat almost, or do you think it's easier to swim horizontally? Cause I would imagine vertically would be easier. Vertically, like diving down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, just like instead if you're... of diving down. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I think I think swimming with a tail is easier overall. Oh, really? Yeah, I because the movement that you're doing, you're doing a dolphin kick. Mm -hmm. You're using your entire body to move and cut through the water. Okay. Instead of like kicking and like having that resistance, um, I do think that doing the dolphin kick and wearing a tail is easier no matter what um it's hard to learn it at first because it's like a weird movement yeah but um i would say diving vertically is easier and i love going like as deep as possible and then then enjoying my dive um then doing it like horizontally like in a pool for example if i'm at three feet there's like more buoyancy so i'm like gonna float more if right. I'm if I'm at that depth, but if I'm just diving deep, 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 then I can uh, stay down longer, and that's ultimately what I want. <laughs> so with that, you probably prefer swimming in the ocean to a pool. 
Because there's more. Depth. Um, I do. I do. Um, depending on the occasion, I feel like in the ocean, I do it mostly for fun. Um, there's not a lot of work. The fishies don't pay me the sand dollars, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do film and do content in the ocean. Uh, but in pools is where my work really is at, and so I I love a good pool and I love space and I love salt water and I love the fun aspects of of just the different structures I can be in you know um it's part of like the fun of being a performer in water is like what's my pool gonna look like today you know uh, or my clients sending me their the photos of their pool so I can like plan ahead where's my entrance where I'm gonna be at and things like that so I I love both but of course I am an ocean girl I love to go diving and that's where I would love to live for the rest of my life if I could. So, <laughs> so one last pool question that we had on the list is if you could create your ideal pool, you've mentioned several things already. You want depth, you want salt water. Yeah. Uh, so, so if uh, you could create acrylic window, a, a <laughs> acrylic window. Okay. So tell us what, any other features that you would like with your pool? Um, I would like waterfalls. Um, I would like a lazy river because now that you said that, I've never been in one um, as a mermaid. Lazy river, waterfalls, acrylic window, deep salt water. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, maybe something fun, like the shape of it could be like a seashell or like a nautilus or something like that. As far as like the shape of the pool. What do you think? Uh, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> fantastic <laughs> you talked about the business side of it a lot like there's a lot going on in the the background um besides just the actual entertainment so how do you balance the artistic and the business side you kind of talked about it a little bit um already uh, maybe just dive into it a yeah. little deeper i guess yeah we can definitely do that um the i love business i've learn to love my business uh and learning how to manage it yeah uh and um i feel like i've had to because it became my full-time job so i there was not only not another choice for me i wasn't gonna go back to working i was a mermaid like who's <laughs> ever gonna do that right yeah. um but but that meant really uh trying to get the work and and pretty much uh, being my own shameless self-promoter, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I spend a lot of time also in marketing um, I, and managing my bookings. Uh, I There's not a lot of people that can understand what I do. Yeah. So those are things that are hard to give to someone else to do for me. Um, and marketing and uh, managing my bookings is the hardest part. So I'm Creatively... Somehow it's easier because I have I've always had this huge imagination um, since I was a little girl. And I've had this mentality of nothing is impossible. If you can imagine it, you can definitely like have it. And I have proof of that. I have written things and scripts and planned things uh, for my shows. And, and I have created things that I've never done before that haven't been done before. Yeah. I have um, a whole light up waterproof costume that goes underwater that no one else has that. And it's just, I don't know. I've been very creative in the past eight years, I think as a mermaid, the mermaid aspect of things opens up the possibilities because it's already a crazy thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I can add other crazy things to it and make them happen so i think creatively that part is easy creative process but the the business side is just kind of like yeah it's just like any other business so you have to do all the things sorry to cut you off i'm so sorry um so with i'm just wondering because like youtubers back in the day where there's not that many and now there's like so many so oh, yeah. when you first started, was it like real small community of mermaids and now it's maybe growing a little bigger or is it still relatively around the same? I'm just. Wondering. Yeah. Um, when I first started, it was more like um, 
It was very like an obscure, like niche. Like it wasn't mm-hmm. a lot of people. It was mostly enthusiasts and hobbyists. I feel like there's more people now that dream of making it a job. Um, but there's only a few people that are actually doing that. Okay. Um, yes, I think the internet uh, has inspired many to pursue this as a hobby or as a job. Um, YouTube, I feel like you, there's not a lot of mermaids on YouTube yet. Um, my favorite mermaid that inspired me was mermaid Melissa. And she was like probably the biggest mermaid on YouTube. And I was like, I could never be as big as her. And, and I, and after surpassing her, I don't think she's doing much these days, but she's awesome. She's amazing. She inspired me a lot in, and yeah, YouTube has become a huge part of my life and there's not a lot of mermaids on youtube yet i would say so, um it's youtube is a lot of work oh yeah oh we we understand that so <laughs> we uh we dabble at it so you you do a very yeah. good job <laughs> what, you know what the trick is it's consistency yep. you have to show up every day oh 100 percent. what is your <laughs> most popular video my most popular video is, I think it reached 50 million views oh, wow. on TikTok. Um, and it's my favorite video of all time. I'm so glad that that was the one that went viral. I mean, uh, so many have gone viral, but that one's like top one is um, in at Atlantis. I'm diving down and I'm holding on to the wheel at the bottom and I'm there for like a long time, just waving at the kids and the kids are on the windows and it's like just a long stretch of, of a video. And yeah, I got 50 million views. So that's really awesome. I think at, the, at this point, I've gotten over half a billion views overall in my videos on social media, which is an insane amount to me. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, oh, I mean, thank you. Well, like you said, it takes a lot of work to show up every day and do that. So, uh, yeah, but. How long have you been making uh, YouTube videos? On YouTube, I have been there since last year, like full time, like not full time, but like consistently. Right. Um, I opened like my YouTube account maybe in 2018 and never did anything with it. And then last year I decided to have my series, but also complement that with the shorts, YouTube shorts. And posting on YouTube shorts every day. And really that's what pushed me. And now I'm like over a million subscribers on YouTube. So my TikTok is bigger, but so YouTube did you, is did you start with TikTok and then you uh kind of funneled the following you had from TikTok over to YouTube? Was that kind of how you did it? No. no? Okay. No, I feel like I have completely different audiences in okay. my platforms. I started on Instagram first, which be- that became like kind of a way for me to connect with with clients and things like that. And it was more like work um, than TikTok when when uh, COVID hit, you know, 2020 on 20 in 2020. Um, that's when everybody was bored, stuck at home. So I started doing TikToks and I, I don't know, it went completely crazy and viral and. TikTok is my biggest account so far. It's at 2.3 million. And then when I started working on YouTube, that was a completely different audience. Uh, Facebook too is like almost half a million. Um, and so it's nice to have different people across all platforms too. I don't think I have the same fans. Uh, some of them might be, but um, but yeah, YouTube is more like kids and people from around the world. TikTok is more the U.S. and both kids and adults, maybe. And Instagram is mostly adults, mostly in the U.S. So it's YouTube is like kind of like more world-rounded, I think. Um, and yeah, I've been, my videos have been showing all over the world. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's really cool to see that. So what, with that, What's your goal with saving the seas in the future? Well, my goal is to, I would love to have an actual facility where kids can come and maybe not just one, 
not just one of them, but like a, a chain, a chain of uh, an educational center that kids could come and learn about the ocean and we could have beach cleanups and things like that, organize that. Um, I would love to continue improving our virtual educational experiences so that kids across the world can actually learn about the ocean. There's a lot of uh, communities in the world that don't have that type of education and therefore they don't understand that the cause and effect, right? Um, They don't have the means to use products that are eco-friendly. So just bringing that type of awareness like the ocean covers most of our planet than than land in comparison so it's i would love to bring that education to all parts of the world really as many as i could that's really cool so would uh and those facilities i'm sure will have aquariums too where you could teach people to be mermaids as as well (laughs) yeah well so here's the thing about conservation, right? Okay. Is that there is, um, it's kind of controver- controversial to have um, an aquarium. And even for me, like when I work, Atlantis is a different story because Atlantis has such a great uh, ocean conservation initiative as well. Yeah. Um, but captivity is mm. an issue. Yeah. with aquariums so to me it's like mm, it's not that type of thing um i would like to have arts and entertainment be the center of the draw for yeah. kids to come rather than animals you know in fish tanks and behind cages so i think uh captivity is a whole other issue yeah, and yeah focus mostly on plastic pollution and just being better humans with our daily actions so which we all can do (laughs) what would be some suggestions that uh we do as humans of course if you could give Um, us some advice here what could we do just even from what you buy at the store is is super super important and making those choices Because when you buy something, that means that company is going to make more of it. So if you buy packs and packs of plastic bottles or water bottles, then not only you're creating more waste, but then you're just creating more of that supply. When you can just have one reusable bottle that you can fill up every day and uh, avoid, you know, thousands and thousands of plastic bottles to end up in the trash or littered and everything ends up in the ocean. So that's one thing is just pay attention to what you buy and make eco-friendly choices, the packaging as well. Um, Everything that goes in the trash could be reduced. Um, Single-use plastics is is a big, big one for us in the conservation world is to refuse single-use plastics like if you go to a restaurant and they give you they try to give you a plastic fork or a plastic spoon that you're just going to use one time um to refuse that and maybe bring your own bring your own containers your own reusable bags um and uh and just be more responsible for that type of thing rather than taking something that's going to be used one time and throwing it in the trash um participate in um, community activities. I think people like being together and sharing the same vision is super important for us as humans. So in doing beach cleanups or going to like do an eco tour um, or just traveling with a group to a sustainable destination, that is super, super cool as well. Um, So there's so many, there's endless ways that you can help, you know, reduce the waste um, that our planet has been taking, as well as um, carbon emissions with, you know, with our daily lives, how much you're driving and what you're using, what you're burning, um, all of those things. So it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot. And for kids, it's even harder to explain to kids because you have to kind of simplify these topics and um, 
And that's what we're working on right now is to how do we simplify it so that kids can understand that that there's a cause and there's an effect and what they can do about it in their daily lives. So it's tough. Conservation is not easy. I'm wondering um, when you do your dives, what's the most common litter that because I've seen a video you picking the litter off the bottom of the ocean floor, which I think was really Mm -hmm. cool. Uh, What's the most common thing you see down there? That's not supposed to be there. Uh, bottles, plastic bags, forks, straws. Um, I would say that's the most uh, fish nets or parts of fish nets. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, uh, those are the most um, I have seen. I think plastic is glass is one thing. You know, glass. Nobody should be throwing trash in the ocean, first of all, but glass has, you know, it can break down into sand, let's say. Uh, but plastic doesn't. Plastic breaks down into even smaller pieces of plastic that um, that fish can eat, mistake it by food, or um, it's just, you know, just a terrible outcome for for our marine life to have so much plastic in the ocean. But yeah, that's usually the most. It's plastic bags, bottles, uh, straws, um, at the beach, cigarette buds, um, bottle caps. We find all sorts of things too, but those are the most common ones. Have you found anything down there that was really cool? Maybe it it belonged down there. So like, I know coral reefs are really cool. What do you, what do you think at the bottom of the ocean is the coolest thing besides obviously the animals? Cause they're awesome. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of plant life and there's a lot of really cool like brain coral is super cool to me brain coral like looks like an actual brain and they can be like huge boulders those are really cool i feel like the ocean has so many different things i love the animals of course uh that's my main thing like if i see a dolphin if i see a shark if i see even the smallest fish an angel fish or Whatever it is, I just, I love it so much. As far as the structures, you can just see how much um, you know, the the corals are being affected. For example, you can see coral bleaching everywhere. Mostly here in Florida, around the coast, there's a lot of um, coral bleaching that is being found everywhere. Sea urchin uh, disease is kind of like a new thing um, in the warm waters. and weird fish behavior and things like that um that's being caused by all the toxicity but anyway back to your question (laughs) um yeah i just i see a lot of really cool things down there um um, there's a lot a lot of really cool artificial reefs and things like that that you know humans can actually put something really nice in the ocean is those amazing artificial uh reefs that are beautiful art structures that are um they put the the material inside of them that they can grow into actual plant life to fit feed the fish and everything. Oh, that's so awesome. that's cool. I didn't know. Yeah, that, no, that thing. it's it's really really cool. Yeah, there's a lot of um, memorials like you know they they build these beautiful structures for that, and there's also different organizations that are in conservation that are creating these structures and deploying them putting them at the bottom of the ocean so they can grow life because the coral reefs themselves are uh, suffering. They're, they're going, they're going white. They're, they're getting bleached, which is a sign for the stress. They could, could come back to life. Um, It's not too late when you see a coral that is white, uh, like bleach white. Um, But it, in most cases, they don't come back. They just continue to die. And then they turn into a rock. And then there's no more life on there. And so that feeds a lot of the marine life. And uh, so, yeah, artificial reefs are great, great to find down there. Um, And I've seen quite a few that are super, super cool. I've seen giant statues of mermaids. (laughs) I've seen jacks at the bottom of the ocean. Um, Some that are like different cool shapes and... um, yeah, it's just really cool to see that humans can actually put something in the ocean that is going to be helpful for our marine life. So we need more of those. Long term, where where do you want to take your career? 
Well, right now I'm writing a book. <laughs> I'm I'm dabbing into the author part of me. And I think that that's kind of where I want to go. Um, I would like to grow Mermaid L as a brand. Um, and of course, I love performing. So I'm going to perform until I no longer can. Um, but eventually, I would love Mermaid L to be um, kind of like an enterprise. Um, working on the book, that's a chapter book. It's a series of 10. It's for wow. uh, middle middle readers. So it's kind of like your Harry Potter and your um, a mix of Harry Potter and a mix of, um, I don't know, something quirky and funny, like, I don't know, dog mad. My, my, my son loves those type of books that are like chapter books, but they're also super, super fun. Um, and then I would love to make a movie one day um, or have my t- my YouTube series become a TV series or something like that. That is uh, for the purpose of educating children through fun stuff, through mermaid magic and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think ultimately I would like Mermaid L to survive and be timeless and be like her own character, kind of like how Ariel is. Nobody will ever forget Ariel. Um, so would love to for mermaid out that has such a big purpose to protect our oceans i would love for that to continue to grow even if i'm not the one you know playing her all the time um as i get older <laughs> i i would like for her to become her own character her own superhero that's cool um I, I, that's awesome and i was wondering what was the movie you Im- imagined what was it what would that be about um, so the movie, I would like for the movie to be the story of the book. The book is exciting. It's kind of like action, adventure, kind of spooky. Um, I don't know if I should give it all away, but there's a, okay. you know, very scary villain. Okay. And Mermaid Ella has to defeat this villain when she gets his superpowers. And so it's kind of like your your superhero story, but um in the form of a mermaid we don't have a mermaid superhero now we have aquaman (laughs) but there's no mermaid superhero and mostly with the purpose of you know something that is so real and so current like ocean conservation so well i would love for it to be like uh an animated movie maybe not really live action but maybe definitely like animated for kids that's gonna be full of action and and uh, inspire many to to protect our oceans. So. so you've outlined ten books in the series. Is there one that's coming soon? Yes, um, my first one is is coming soon. Okay. Um, I don't have anything for sure yet, but so far the publication date is June third of twenty twenty five. So it's going to be Mermaid Owl Saving the Seas. And it's going to be a fun chapter book. Um, and I hope kids all over the world will, will love it. So very soon I will be announcing what the deal is there and how people can pre-order it and all of that. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a lot of work. Um, writing is completely different than, you know, writing scripts and yep. things like that that I used to do for for work and and what I do now. So writing a book has been a challenge and I've been learning. I have a great, great agent and a great team of editors and we're just like getting the story down and it's been so fun. Yeah, it's a process. I'm I'm currently trying to write on my own just for fun. And it's oh that's amazing. It's so hard. Do you have an yeah. idea? Is in it your fiction head? or nonfiction? It's it's a political fiction right now, but it evo- okay. like how you have you outlined. It's it's pretty much outlined to turn into its own like universe. It's fantasy, so it's just get from oh, modern that's day amazing. to there. Yeah. So, but yeah, that yeah. that's really cool that what you're doing, and that's next year. So that's that's coming up. That's cool. It's coming up. I I didn't expect it honestly. I was I, I was not ready. But, you know, you're never ready. You're just kind of like, my agent was like, well, this is the deadline. And I'm like, I will make it happen. And I 
turned everything in um, the day before. So that was early. <laughs> oh, good. Good for you. I'm, I'm always the last second. So everything. Oh, yeah. Same. I always say I was born last minute because everything is last minute for me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a final message you wanted to share with our listners, uh, what would that be? Can I make a joke? Oh, Can I make a joke? Sure. Please, before people get in the pool and before a mermaid gets in the pool, please don't shock the pool. That's, Oof. I beg you, <laughs> don't <laughs> shock the pool. That's horrible. Um, yeah. You want I a mermaid imagine. to have eyeballs. <laughs> but yes. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I, I would like to share that there is so much magic and amazing energy out there. Just whatever you have in your heart, go for it. Um, it's not going to be easy, but it is possible. And that is enough just to know that it is possible to keep on going and with consistency and discipline and a couple of downs, but mostly ups, um, it's anything is possible. If I can be a mermaid, I, I could, anyone could be anything else. And that's really what I feel like I inspire in others. And also please ditch single use plastics. Um, Re reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse, and um, do a couple of beach cleanups and follow my journey. Well, we'll uh, have all your contact information on all your social media available for everybody so they can follow the, uh, the your journey, which uh, the, you've done amazing stuff so far, and I look forward to uh, seeing what you do in the future as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And your pools are so beautiful. Well, like I mean it. If you're, if I'm ever around, I'll let you guys know, and maybe we can do a photo shoot or an event or something. That, I don't know. Something that would be fun. fun. So, are you based mainly in Orlando or Miami, or where are you? Um, I'm in Orlando for the most part now, and um, but we're doing a a tour. Um around the country until November, I want to say. And then I'll be back in Orlando in November. Um, so yeah, I'll be mostly in Orlando after we come back. But we're planning on driving to California and coming back to Florida. So we might be driving through Texas. It's, it's in the way. Uh, from Florida yeah. to California, we're kind of in the in the path. We are, yep. It takes about a day to go through. <laughs> It's a long I drive. love pools. I mean, it's it. The pool is my stage. Yes, well, we have some crazy ones down here. We have lots of fun ones, uh, yeah. and that's the fun of what we get to do. And actually, we'll be in Florida in October. Yeah. Uh, so we, we'll be visiting some really crazy stuff uh, near Tampa. Uh, so okay, all right, that's not too far. Yeah. So some <laughs> some pool builders that do some amazing work in that area that are friends of ours. So anyway, but thanks again. And, uh, we'll share everything, uh, with everybody and we'll look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank and you like Mermaid El says, Mermaid kisses, starfish wishes. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, an amazing journey of someone's career to, uh, not know how to swim to all the way to the professional mermaid. Yeah, that's quite of a, quite a transformation for sure. Cause I could swim good, but the, the deep sea diving, it, it scares me to death. So I, I don't know how she did that. Cause she, she went through the whole thing. I can't even imagine doing that. No. Well, yeah, it's one thing to swim, but there's a lot of people that just going below the surface of the ocean spooks them. So, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, it's amazing how she learned to go through diving and breathing and to hold her breath and all these things. And I, I just think that what she's created is so fabulous because it was like, okay, I just don't want to be a mermaid. That's that's, I can sit by the pool with a tail on. Anybody could do that. You know, she, uh, 
it's taken classes on oceanography to to learn yeah. all the the things, and then she's produced this awesome Saving by the Seas, uh, you know, video series for kids, which goes into all kinds of details on just oceans and ocean conservation, and I mean, it's just an amazing. Well, she had a film background too. Yeah, she was in a Kanye West music video. She's performed in front of Bruno Mars. So she's very successful at what she does, whatever it might be at the time. So that is really cool. I think the the, the thing I took away from it that I didn't really expect uh, was the, I didn't realize they made coral reefs. Like they actually make them and then they put them underwater. So that, that blew me away because I didn't even know that was possible. So in my head, I'm imagining them like hauling off a coral reef <laughs> man made one the big old boat and then dropping it down so oh i I just think that her journey you know we talked about with rowdy about teaching kids to swim yeah but there's so many adults that as an adult they're like well i don't know how to swim and that's the way i'm going to be the rest of my life Mm -hmm. and she basically said well (laughs) and it's funny her friends give her a hard time yeah so that's she, what good friends are for, right? She's got some good friends, yeah. And so gave her a hard time and pushed her into a, a fabulous career. So that's a pretty good situation. So when your friends give you a hard time, thank them for it. Yeah, moral of the story. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that it's got, she's got some really good information. If you got kids, you may want to have them check it out. You may want to check out some of the, the things that she's done. Uh, her challenge for us, uh, conservation wise, those were all really good things to consider that we all can make an impact, uh, on our environment and on our ocean. I mean, it's everybody's ocean. And if we take care of it, it'll, it'll take care of us. But if we don't take care of it, then it's going to cause us a lot of problems. Yeah. We already got a lot of problems that we can't control. So might as control what you can control. Yeah. So but uh, a little bit different than the, the normal uh, episode. But, you know, we love water, as I said in the beginning. And, you know, anything that we can do uh, in and around water is an amazing situation. So that's a, a fun environment to be in. It's also like how big the industry is. Because the first time I saw a mermaid was at the uh, the show, the pool show. So it's like there's so many different ways people enter this industry in some form or fashion i think it's incredible so well hope uh you guys enjoyed the uh episode and uh, if you've got questions for mermaid l we'll put her contact information uh on the uh podcast and please if you've got questions that came up that you thought of uh, send those in to us we appreciate all the questions that were sent in for this episode and hopefully we can provide you more information about everything that's outdoor-related pool uh, in your backyard. So we'll probably dive into some more details in the next couple episodes that have to do more with outdoor living, which uh, we haven't focused on as much lately, but we'll be having those coming soon. So look forward to talking to you all some more, and uh, we'll go from there. Y'all have a good one.